Hey there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Before we get started today, I want to let you know that I am having a 40% off sale in my store for all my online classes, and I will have a coupon code in the video description, and the deal runs through Memorial Day, so check that out if you want to pick up a class. Today we are going to sketch a noodle bowl here for Sketchbook Sunday, and I'm starting off in my Fabriano Venice book. It's my favorite sketchbook, I think, with a mechanical pencil, and I'm just sketching on the bowl. Now, it's kind of a weird view because it's, uh, you're kind of looking into the bowl, but you don't have a full circle. You know, you're seeing some of the side of the bowl too, so that ellipse is a little bit tricky. So I'm turning my sketchbook around a couple different ways so I can make sure that nothing is really off. And when I sketch, I'm really loose. I have lots of hairy lines there, and I draw until I get it right, and then I erase the lines I don't need. Now, occasionally, I erase the wrong lines, and I have to go back in and tweak it a little bit, but I find that technique really helps me when I'm trying to draw something that's symmetrical, man-made, um, something where I need a straight edge, like if I'm doing a vase or a building or anything like that. So don't be afraid to turn that sketchbook around. That's why I like to work on um, something I can move rather than taping things down to my table. I like to pick it up and move it around if at all possible. Or if you're working at an easel, if you can stand back from it, that helps. Or if you can like turn your canvas around or even look at it, its reflection in a mirror, that will help you quite a bit too. I am placing all of these um, elements in the bowl. I'm, I got the lettuce kind of dangling over the edge. It gives us nice texture and shape. That um, egg in the center is probably the focal point. I've got a couple pieces of some sort of meat on the edge. I don't know if those are ribs or what, but it does add an interesting texture and color. We've got some radishes, some carrot sticks, and of course those awesome um, swirly curly ramen noodles in the middle, which gives me the nostalgic feel from the 80s. Like, you know, when uh, those cup of soups were really popular. I remember it's like my school teachers would always have those little cup of soups for lunch. And, um, you know, it was always a kind of like a rainy day lunch type of thing, like ramen noodles um, and also radishes. Radishes were so popular in the 80s. My dad had to have radishes every night with a salad. And um, I never liked them. They, they're kind of like spicy with no flavor. Uh, and I wasn't even sure if they still sold radishes, honestly. I had looked for them at the grocery store the other day because I wasn't sure. Do people still buy those? Um, they are awfully pretty, though, and they do give a nice crunch. But the flavor, uh, I don't know. I mean, definitely, I'm, I'm not too picky about vegetables, but they are definitely not my favorite. They kind of ranked right there with zucchini, which I'll eat, but not my favorite. So the color medium I'm using for most of this sketch today are watercolor brush pens. And the brand I'm using is Genuine Crafts. And I've got their 100 color set, which has a lot of really unusual colors, which is nice for this set because a lot of times, if you have the smaller sets of uh, watercolor markers, they have more of your, you know, your bright colors, which is important because those are the colors you'll use the most. But this set had a lot of um, really unusual colors, kind of fashion colors or natural colors, um, colors that you just wouldn't have in your typical set of like 48 or under. So I really took advantage of that and use these subtle colors. Now, I don't work on the facing page in my sketchbook, so you can see up at the top of the frame there how I am swatching colors that I'm not so sure about on the paper, just to make sure it's gonna give me what I want. I find the color chips on the ends of these markers and at the nib to be very accurate, so that's really handy. Also, it's very handy because there's no color names on this particular marker brand, so swatching them would be useless because there's no number or name to tell them apart. Uh, so luckily the the color chips are pretty good and then I can just swatch on my facing page in my sketchbook. Now the reason I don't work on every page, I work on one side of the sheet only, is because sometimes I'll use stuff like um, oil pastels and oh, or chalk pastels, things like that, color pencils, and if you work like on the reverse page, you could end up like scribing, like transferring that media onto the facing page. So I only like to have one completed sketch per layout basically. And then I'll make little notes on the opposite page. So, so a lot of times I listen to podcasts and sometimes I'll hear about a book I might want to read. So I'll jot that down. I'll jot down the uh, brand of materials I was using. So if I want to recreate it later, I know exactly what I used. Um, just different little notes like that. If there was an issue I had with any with any product, I'll write that down. So it's just, it's handy to only work on one page in a layout, for me anyway. You can, of course, do whatever you like. Another thing that I try to do when I am sketching here with markers 
um, because I probably used about 25 in the whole piece, is to uh, reuse the markers as many times as possible. And by that, I mean, if I'm using this brown for the meat here, I might also add that into the noodles, I might add it into the shadow, just add it somewhere else so that, um, I'm getting that color somewhere else. So nothing feels like it's cut and pasted on. Nothing feels discordant. And um, that's something that's really easy to do with these pens. Even like by blending it with a water brush and then using the brush on something else without wiping it off, you get that little bit of um, cross pollination. I try to keep my values pretty distinct at this stage. I try to get my dark darks in. Um, I try to contrast it with the lighter areas just so I get that value range. I do leave a little, um, um, kind of a little leeway, meaning like I wouldn't go in and use like black at the beginning stages. I would save that to the end or super, super dark gray or dark indigo. I would always make sure I have some darker colors I can still reach to if I need to. So um, that just kind of is, uh, is like the ace in the hole. You can always go back and, and darken that up if you want to. And you can go and lighten it up as well by using gouache or colored pencils. So kind of keep those things in mind. Now, if you notice the white of the egg, and I want you to kind of keep this in mind as we're working, because I want you to think about how the colors around what you're painting affect the color, how the color looks. So if you look at the white of that, the egg white, look how that almost looks whiter than the background of my paper. It's not, I haven't used any opaque mediums yet. This is just the white of the paper. But since I put that really, really pale bluish gray on the white of the egg, it makes it look brighter white and it makes the um, the surrounding paper look off white because this is kind of the sketchbook has kind of like a natural white page to it. It's not like a super, super bleached white. I prefer a natural warm white uh, paper like watercolor paper or sketchbook paper versus super, super bright white. I used to love the bright white, but um, I don't know. I just I, I just feel like that that slightly off natural paper color is just a little bit more pleasing than a bleached paper surface, but you can see how the white of the egg looks brighter white than the background because of that little bit of blue wash that I put in there. That's where I scribbled that really light blue marker on my uh, silicone mat. That's the Jane Davenport silicone mat underneath, by the way. And I made like a wash with it. So just keep that in mind. Now for the lettuce, I did layers of this kind of like raw sienna color, a celery green color. And then I went in with a darker, um, kind of like a hooker's green color, just to give me those, um, that texture and the color variance that was in the lettuce. It's a bit darker than it's going to end up because I will go in with some gouache later, but I wanted to get that kind of like bubbly texture of the I'm not sure if it's lettuce or bok choy. I think it could be either. It's probably bok choy since this is a uh, um, like a, a ramen noodle bowl, bowl. I don't think they'll put lettuce in there probably. Uh, they'd want a more substantial vegetable that's not going to wilt. And the, the carrots are actually done with several layers. I've used the colors from the yolk of the egg and I've also added a little bit darker of um, orange in there, which I did add a little smidgen of that to the egg yolk because I want to be able to carry your eye through this piece. Um, I wet the radishes to spread out the pink a little bit, and then I used the real brush pen on its own, the magenta color, and just kind of streak some of that in. You can get some really nice line work, soft lines when you go in with the real brush pens and work on top of a damp area. And I recommend you do this with the real brush pens. And the difference between those and say like a Tombow marker that's like a felt tip brush pen is that there's actually little bristles in there. And there are a lot of different brands that make these pens. This brand happens to be Genuine Crafts. They're a fairly new company. Um, but you probably, if you have some from a different company like Zig or Arteza or whatever, go ahead and use what you have. Um, but the nice thing about having the bristles is that it's really gentle on your paper. And especially if you're using a sketchbook like I am here, it's not going to pill the paper. Whereas if you go in on damp paper with like a, a felt tip pen, like a Tombow, it will pill, it'll abrade and it'll also stain your paper. So you'll get these really dark splotches that you can't blend out later. So you just kind of want to keep that in mind. And also that like with a felt tip brush pen, it will suck up the water and stuff that's on your, on your paper. And it could take a while for it to, for the real color to recharge it back into the pen again. And it can, uh, it does seem like when it sucks up water like that, it does tend to want to make the felt tip fray. So I would definitely recommend only going into the damp paper and into the, um, into the, you know, wet washes with the real brush pens. And I, you like, you can pick up water on the real brush pens for a lighter look and it's not going to hurt it. But if you do that with a felt tip pen, it's going to like push the ink back into the barrel of the pen and you're not going to have any color coming out. Um, so that's, that's, I haven't used the felt tip pens too much since I've got different real brush markers and I found them to be just so nice for the way that I like to work.
Uh, so here I am using some of this light gray. It's it's a probably the lightest gray that's, well, no, I think there's one that's a little bit lighter. So this is probably the medium gray. And I'm just kind of putting this modely shadow down. So I'm working quickly so and working on the side of the brush so I get um, a modeled look. I don't want a solid look. And then I scribbled some on my mat and I'm spreading it out onto the paper. I'm using, like I mentioned before, the Jane Davenport Silco Matte. So it's kind of glossy and the paint beads up or the ink beads up on it. Um, so it might be hard to see on camera. I'm using the pen itself to do some line work. I'm just doing cross hatching to give the fabric that linen texture and it's going to soften out as I go over with more washes, but I just love the effect and I kind of wish that I had, uh, I had found a way, maybe used a darker color and done that at the end because I do love that sketchy fabric look. Uh, and I'm going in with a darker gray. It's probably the darkest gray before you get to black. And I'm putting in some more shadows because I realized that I didn't have the contrast that I needed. And I'm just spreading that out. Oh, I also want to mention you can use a plate to scribble your pens on. I think that would actually work a little bit better, like using a ceramic dish because it wouldn't beat up and you'd be able to see your puddles of color a lot easier. Or like the Waffle Flower Media Mat that I reviewed a couple weeks ago, that wouldn't beat up either. Of course, it's 36 bucks, so it's a little on the pricey side, but it's definitely an option. I'll uh, link to all these different things I've talked about in the video description so you can check them out if you're curious. So now I'm going in with this medium gray that I used on the... Um, on the fabric it's is it the medium one or the darker one? I actually think it's the darker one. And I'm going in and putting in some of the darkest shadows. So if you look at the reference photo, um, you can see where it's almost black when you look into the bowl and you're seeing like things overlapping, like next to the egg yolk, it, uh, egg white, it is black almost in there. So I'm going in and putting in those really deep shadows because that's where you're gonna get the depth and the, the contrast to make it look kind of realistic. Um, and you gotta have those shadows in there. You need to value, value is king. Even if you're colorblind or you wanna do this in completely different colors uh, or you can't differentiate the colors very well, if you have the values right, it's going to look fabulous. Values are so much more important than, than color. That's why uh, it's important to learn how to draw with graphite before you jump in with color because you need to understand the values. That's gonna make you a much stronger artist than knowing how to mix color, which you which is important if you're gonna work, work with color, but values is, so much more important. Um, you know, learning your basic drawing techniques is so important. And I do have a class, Learn to Draw with Lindsay, uh, that goes through drawing a variety of different subjects, goes through the basics of teaching you how to draw what you see, and also the techniques of blending and shading. And uh, you can use the coupon code for that to get 40% off. So check that out if you want some help drawing, because it's, you know, You'll be holding your hand through that course. And uh, I've had a lot of successful uh, testimonials there from students that have really improved their drawing and created some amazing stuff in that class. Now I'm going in with that super dark gray. This actually might be, this one's actually might be black. And I'm putting in those really, really dark shadows. So if you look at the reference photo and squint, you might wanna just bring it up big on your computer. Use the link in the description for the reference photo. If you look at that big and you squint, you can really see where the darks are. And that can be very helpful. Um, don't be afraid of the dark. Don't be afraid of going deep with your shadows because that contrast is what you need to get that you know really in-depth. Uh, look. Now here I'm going with a super dark reddish brown and I'm stippling, which means I'm kind of dotting uh, in some shadows here on the meat. And I want to dot rather than color just so I get that kind of glistening texture. It's kind of like got a um, like an oily, maybe oily texture to it. And it's kind of got a, like a roughness, but since it's, it's glossy, it's got these, uh, these little textures. You know, you see this like um, rough texture to it. Kind of like sandpaper, but it's shiny, oily sandpaper. Um, it's a hard time describing meat. <laughs> it's juicy. I think it's, it would be like a juicy type of meat um, because it's all like fatty and glossy. And um, I'm doing that, getting those dark shadows in. Now I will go in with some gouache and colored pencil later. Not very much though. I'm doing as much as I can with these pens and with the, just the water brushes. And, uh, oh, I wanted to mention, I'm using Arteza water brushes. I really like these as far as water brushes go. I'm not a huge fan of water brushes and I tend to not use them um, if I'm sitting at my desk because I have real brushes handy. But um, since the real brush pens have such fine bristles, I don't didn't really feel like I needed a high quality watercolor brush. I could use, use a uh, high quality 
watercolor brush. I could use, use a water brush. And um, this, that set of brushes is very affordable. And there's also a 20% off Memorial Day sale at Arteza. And I'll link that coupon code down below too if you want to uh, save some money on those water brushes or their watercolor sketchbook, which is very similar to the Venice book that I'm using here by Fabriano, but way cheaper. So uh, that's definitely something to look up. Also, the Stillman and Byrne beta series mixed media book is very similar to this paper in the Fabriano Venice book. I'm not sure if the Fabriano Venice book is discontinued. I received mine in a smart art box, but in it's they're expensive. When you go to look for them on art supply shops or on Amazon, and some art supply stores have them listed as discontinued, so I don't know if they just weren't selling and they're not going to carry them, or if the product is actually not being made anymore. I'm not sure, but um, I will list those two alternatives that I mentioned because I think the paper is just as good and it's way cheaper. Um, they're not hard. Well, yeah, one is a hardbound. Anyway, I'm going in with some gouache. This is the Maya gouache. I had a lot of people ask me to review this. I've done a few paintings with them. I'll be reviewing it once I get a really good grasp on um, on how it works, but I got to tell you, I didn't like it at first because it comes in these like little jelly cups. Like if you got jam at a diner, you know how it comes in those little, little plastic cups where you peel the foil off. That's how this comes. Um, it's in a really sturdy box uh, palette that is reusable and uh, it's got a nice mixing palette on it. It comes in pink or mint and I didn't know how I would do mixing on this mint, but it didn't distract me at all. It was fine. But the key is let the paints dry out. So letting them dry out till they were like, not like super hard, but they're definitely, you know, a lot harder. And then I add my water to it. I like them so much better because when they were just wet from the pots, I felt like I was painting with like kids temper paint or poster paint, but letting it dry out a bit, it definitely feels more like a high quality gouache and I like it quite a bit. And it's, it's cheap. It's like 18 bucks for 18 colors in this gorgeous palette that you definitely want to save and reuse. So, um, so I will have a review on that, but I'll link that down below for those of you that were wondering about it. You'll get a better look at the palette at the end when I, um, zoom out on my table, but, uh, but so far so good. I'm, I'm really liking it. It didn't, I was iffy at first cause I didn't like working from it wet, but I don't like working from gouache wet typically anyway. So there's just my uh, my two cents there. I'm using it to get that texture on the lettuce. It's got that really curly, bubbly texture and I needed something opaque. I needed to get that spring green color and a little bit of white in there, the reflection to give it that a crispy, like plump leaf texture. And um, I think it looks pretty luscious if I do say so myself. And you can see it. I love how it kind of like wraps around the sprouts. I just feel like it makes everything feel nestled. And that's because we put those shadows in. That's why, because we did all that work, all that baseline work. Now this illustration took me two hours. So I don't want you to see the 25 minute video and be like, oh, well, I'm gonna whip that right up right now. This is time-lapsed. It took me two hours. I took my time on it and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was so fun to paint. I honestly did not want this painting session to end because it was just so enjoyable. Um, I found that the colors in this gouache set mixed really well. Like I'm using some like Prussian blue and burnt umber to get those really darks in the uh, meat and also in the shadow areas of the um, of the bowl. I don't like to use black paint. I did use that black marker, but um, I find that like when you have a black ink marker, it's usually done with a couple different colors and they are a little more lively than like a black pigment that you would get in like a paint personally. And you can also use a gouache to do any, if you have like little, if there's like herbs, um, or spices on the, like right on top of the noodles. It looked like there were little shreds of maybe scallions or something there. So I, I painted those in and I brightened up the areas on the sprouts where they were a little bit lighter so they didn't look so streaky and dark. So gouache is really wonderful when you're doing marker work. The nice thing about gouache is that not only can you go over stuff that you've already painted, uh, like ink and watercolor, but you can work over gouache really easily with colored pencil or ink. So you can keep like going on top of the gouache without um, having things resist or bother it, which is really nice. I love that gouache is getting more popular these days because I think it's just such a wonderful bridge medium. I think that like if you're using watercolor and you want to maybe graduate up to acrylics or oils, um, gouache is such a wonderful medium for that. I actually don't care for acrylics that much. So if I do something with gouache, I know somebody could follow along with acrylics and it would be just fine. I like how I can go back in with a wet brush and re 
constituted a bit. I love how I can go over with my inks and I can um, work on top of the gouache like I am here. Probably wouldn't do it with a felt tip pen because it might lift up some of the gouache paint, but the, uh, the real brush pens are so gentle that they just deposit the ink and they don't lift anything back up, which is really nice. And um, now finally, I'm going in with my beloved Prismacolor pencil. I like Prismacolors, they're my favorite. They're not the most expensive out there and you can often find really good deals on Amazon and some of the big art suppliers, they, they tend to um, drop the prices once in a while. So I got the set of like 150 for 59 dollars on amazon last year i haven't seen it that low since but i grabbed it because i have a lot of shorties in my collection that i need to replace so uh so it worked out really well but i love how it's kind of opaque i can go over the noodles i can add like those bumpy like highlights but it's still gonna let some of it the stuff show through underneath it's also really good when you're drawing something that's kind of solid like the ceramic bowl um it just gives it a little bit more heft and it gives it a little bit more weightiness to it and i can also refine my edges so i have that nice smooth edge that i was after that i might have like bumped a marker into or you know i might have got it too wet and had my ink spill out a little bit so it lets me refine things um so these are a waxier pencil that's why they're a little more opaque than say polychromos or the Arteza pencils, but all, you know, you hear pencils being called oil-based or wax-based, which is kind of a misnomer because all pencils have some wax and oil. The higher the wax content, the more opaque they're going to be and the more brittle they might be. The higher the oil content, the more um, softer they're typically going to be and the uh, less prone to breakage uh, and the more translucent they're going to be. So it boils down to personal preference. Like I find the Arteza pencils to be a little bit more oily. They're a little more translucent. Um, Prismacolors are a little more opaque and their pastel range is um, second to none as far as I'm concerned for all the different ones I've tried. I also like the Derwent Color Soft because they're so waxy and opaque, but they still pack a punch with a the pigment. They're not like, you know, weak colored pencils like you might get at the dollar store that won't give you any color. They're just too hard and waxy. I feel like you get a really nice soft waxy version with the Prisma colors. So for me, they're my favorite. They're not everybody's favorite, but for the style of work that I like to do, how I like to layer them, so, since I'm not using colored pencils 100%, I'm using them in conjunction with inks and gouache, they're just ideal for me. You might practice, you might buy a couple different pencils from different companies that sell open stock like Prismacolor, Polychromos, Koinor, uh, and see what you like the best, or you might take a chance on a large set from a company and, you know, adapt your style to work with them. Now for my final highlights, I'm pulling out my trusty Posca pen. I used to use a um, white gel pen, but I find that I didn't use it enough and it, they would clog and dry up on me. So if you use them every day, a gel, white gel pen is fine. If you don't, I recommend the Posca pen because not only does it not clog up on you as frequently, but you can refill it. Now the company doesn't recommend that, but I unscrew it and I put in, I use Chromacryl Blockout White mixed with water and I put that in because it's super opaque and it thins down really well and it's matte, uh, but any sort of matte white acrylic ink or acrylic paint would work just fine for that. Or the pens aren't totally expensive if you want to redo it, but if you're trying to do zero waste and not, you know, have to buy so many things, then that's a really good option. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial today. There you can see the gouache palette a little bit better. I'll link to everything plus the coupon codes I mentioned for my classes and also the Arteza coupon code for this weekend. So you can check that out if you are watching this Memorial Day weekend and you want to save some money. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up before you go and I encourage you to draw something for the fun of it that you want to draw even if it seems silly this weekend. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.